I think we can call our meeting to order. It's 6.05 um, on our agenda. Uh, we have the first item is to review and approve minutes from May 13th, 2020. Are there any um, comments or proposed uh, uh, changes to the minutes? I'm good. Got in our packet. Motion to approve minutes uh, May 13th. Second. All those in favor? John? Yep. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, second item is the vendor and payroll warrants. Um, to review those, those are in the packet as well. Are there any comments or uh, concerns on those? Nope. Were they in the packet? Yep. Yeah, they were in the packet. Oh. Um, and I always forget, so I have to ask Brian, do, I, do we have to vote on that? No, you signed those today, right, Joyce? Yes, I did. Yeah, so they didn't get in the packet this time, but. Oh, okay. We'll the next time. Oh, okay. All right. Um, the uh, third item is uh, public comment. I listen to comments from the public related to items not on the agenda. And um, I don't know that we have many uh, people from the public here. I think we have a reporter um, and we have our town clerk and we have our municipal secretary, all wonderful members of the public. So you're happy to let you speak up now if you like. Okay, uh, hearing nothing, move on to item four, uh, which is uh, reviewing the COVID-19 state of emergency. And the first item is to discuss, review and consider some modifications to uh, three of our uh, directives, the directive limiting work in town buildings, the directive on employee pay, and the uh, emergency order restricting public access to town buildings. And uh, I think Ryan sent this afternoon kind of the latest version with uh, maybe some input from the Board of Health. Is that right? Yeah, the Board of Health and uh, Fred had a couple comments too. Okay. Um, so um, I took a look at, uh, I looked at the second ones more closely than the first ones and I thought they seemed well thought out. Um, John and Fred, do you have anything you would like to uh, add or comment on? Uh, maybe we can take them one at a time. The directive limiting work in town buildings to only essential activities by essential employees and board members and requiring employees to work from home or remain on call to perform essential functions. Um, and now I'm trying to pull that window up on my screen. So I'm looking at it. I can share that if you guys want. That'd be great, thank you. That would be, yeah, why don't we do that? Pull it up on the screen, please. You can see that? Yes. Oh, it's behind one of my other screens. Okay, I'm gonna, I will find it shortly. No, we don't want to do that. There we go. There we go. Now I found it. It was just behind about, I've got a million windows open here on this screen. Okay. So there's kind of a, sort of that preamble paragraph it just has some language about, um, we think it's, safe to start reopening the buildings on a limited basis. But if things start turning in the wrong direction, we may have to close them back down again. Um, this order would rescind the order that closed the buildings. Um, and then so the, really the essence of the order are these bullet points. Um, I'll just summarize them quickly. Um, First one would require everyone going into the building to wear masks unless there's a medical exemption. Um, and we would ask that if people are unable to wear masks that they call ahead so that alternative arrangements can be made. Um, I was on a call yesterday with uh, the Department of Local Services and Lieutenant Governor and their Deputy Legal Counsel and the question was raised if, if someone's refusing to wear a mask 
and they don't have a medical exemption, can you refuse them entry into a public building? And the answer was yes. Hmm. Um, I don't know that we don't ever want to get to that point, but yeah. obviously it, it is really a safety issue. I worry about the enforcement of that. Yeah. I mean, in terms of tempers starting to flare. Yeah, I, it's, it's a real possibility. Yeah. And if they if they are in a building and, and not wearing masks and don't want to leave, who are you going to call? We would call the police. Police, okay. Yep. Yep. So what we're proposing um, for a limited schedule, we would we would only open the front service window at the town offices. Um, it would be for four hours from 8 a.m. to 12 noon on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And I'm by appointment at different times. Um, we we're proposing to open June 1st, so that's next Monday. Um, and we would limit it just to that area um, in front of the service window. The hallways, uh, any of the hallways, restrooms, kitchen area, meeting rooms would all still remain off limits um, to the general public. Um, we've ordered some of those, um, they're like the crowd control barriers with the belt that can be pulled across. Um, and I think a sign can be put on top that can say, you know, employees only so that we mm -hmm. don't have people going down there. Um, so that's, that's what we're thinking in terms of opening the town offices. I think on mm -hmm. Friday, I think Keith can do it on Friday. We're going to install, um, a piece of plexiglass over the outside of the service window. We're gonna leave like a four or five inch gap on the bottom so that documents can be passed underneath in the, mm. uh, the service window, you know, it slides open and shut. That mm. will remain operational from the inside of the office. Um, the biggest concern there was even if you're wearing masks, there's definitely, if someone's right up against the window, which a lot of times people are, the writing on the counter. I don't think that's six feet if someone's if Lynn or Janet are in the office. So um, I'd much rather a solid barrier there. So that should be in place. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna stagger work schedules for the town offices, especially Lynn and Janet um, who share that office. They'll, they'll alternate days. And the town accountant is also there. We're gonna move her into the back, at least for now, into the wide open space in the back so that they would overlap mm -hmm. Um, we have someone there Mondays and Thursdays. Um, so we're going to take them out of that office. So we don't have the, uh, the overlap there. Um, and then the assessors and town administrator are available by appointment. Um, we don't necessarily get a lot of day-to-day -day visitors. Um, I don't know about that. <laughs> that need to do business that can't do business with us. There's some people that come, but um, it's it's different parts of the building, so. Um, and it's separate yeah. offices. Yeah. Uh, Brian, right. do you yeah. do you want to make this appointment advance appointment, or you want somebody to just walk in Monday at eight o'clock and say, "I want an appointment with the town administrator." Um. You want it that soon, or do you want it? I know ahead of time. I mean, ad advanced appointments are best, um, but I, I, we're also going to kind of deal with what happens. Okay. I think advanced appointments are critical because Brian may not be there, and then you have someone wanting to make an appointment for that moment in time. He's not there. He's right. bothering, he or she's bothering everyone else trying to figure out when Brian's going to be back. I think a process needs to be in place for a scheduled appointment like you would with any other with any other functionality that you deal with in life. Yeah. And if it were um, an urgent sort of situation, I mean, I, I like to think that our town administrator and uh, the assessors would be uh, responsive to something that was urgent. 
and it's not necessarily the scenario of someone walking in at 8 a.m. demanding to get up with Brian. Um, but if something were urgent were to come up, I, I think we're of a mind to be as um, accommodating as we can, right? So I don't want people to think, oh, we're trying to wall off our, our assessors or our town administrator, um, that we're just trying to make things as reasonable as possible. Is right. that? Yeah. Okay, but then, then you've got somebody deciding that. Is it urgent or not? I, I, I mean, quite honestly, I couldn't think of a reason or, or a time if someone's in that front service area where I would need to accept anything or um, I, I don't think there's much that I couldn't do by email or by phone. Right. Um, I'm not sure the town administrator or the assessors have 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 functions that are urgent by, by nature. I, I think it's rare. Yeah. yeah. Um, so on the rare occasion that there is one, we can manage that as a, you know, as needed, but it seems like the rules should be making, make an appointment. Yeah. I'm also curious, and I know Lynn's on the phone, and I know Amy's on the phone, Janet's on, I mean, the meeting, obviously, but are, are the employees eager to start to return to normal or would their comfort level be one where they would prefer to continue our, our distant, distant operations for the foreseeable future? I mean, Amy's got like a six month old at home or whatever it is now, a year old at home now, whatever it is. I want to make sure that they're comfortable before we just do a blanket. Yeah, it seems like the trend is good because I don't think anyone, I, I don't want anyone to think that this public health crisis is over because it's clearly not. I okay. think that's covered in the other directive. The, um, the one on, uh, see, this is the one on town building reopening. Um, there was another one on employees returning and that gave a lot of flexibility to, um, uh, you work your hours at home or work your hours in the office um, uh, on a kind of, it, well, you just have to work it out with your supervisor, basically. Yeah, but hey, Joyce, I, I have a question to that. And, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but these directives were not made uniquely for Whitley. They were, they were, it was template directives that are implemented on a town by town basis. Is that accurate or no? I don't know. And Brian might know. Say that again? Are the are the directives that you put forth here? Are they template directives that are just being tweaked to fit Waitley, or is this something that Waitley did on all on its own? No, this is something we put together. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay, so it's not it's not something that was that was created for a larger town, and we're and we're fitting it into a okay, okay. Nope. Because it seems like our operations are so small. I, I I don't I don't think we've missed a beat with the with the distance policy and i don't want to rush back to the office unless people are are eager to rush back to the office yeah i think with the building opening it's i mean to me the primary change from what we have now is that people will be allowed i don't know another 10 feet into the building right now they can go up to that door that says employees only and no further uh now they can go during certain hours through that door and up to the window uh, and speak directly with the town clerk, you know, get actual papers, get married, whatever it is that you need to do in person can now be done in person during these specified times. Doesn't mean you can't do it by appointment. You could probably still arrange some kind of appointment that I think that's allowed in here. Um, and it doesn't give you unrestricted access to the building. It just lets you get about 10 feet further. And so there are now certain things that don't have to be done by special appointment. That, and that's that's to me the main the main change uh, on, on this document, the town opening document, the one about figuring out your um, at home versus at the office hours. That's the other document. Okay, I, I'd like to add to this. Then, I, 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 again, I, I think that we're all rushing back too soon. So I'm I'm an outlier, but. I'd like to add to this document that if there is someone already at the window, if there's one person in the building, a, a, a non-employee, 
that anyone else, the line forms outside of the building for the foreseeable future, that there aren't people waiting inside the foyer for the next in line mm -hmm. to, to be to be welcomed in. Yeah, I, I think we're, I think that's that was the idea. Well, it should yeah. be it should be stated here explicitly. <laughs> okay. So maybe that second bullet point, the front service window of the town offices will be open to the public for four hours from eight to noon on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday of each week beginning June 1st, 2020. Um, would it be a separate bullet point perhaps, um, but what would we add in there to address John's, just to make it, make it really a part of the policy um, um, I, I don't know if I want to say person by person, because if two people are there who are cohabitating, they're already, um, you know, I think they can yeah. go together, right? But parties of, if there's a party at the window, um, when a member of the public arrives, they shall wait outside until the window is available. It's something like that. Yeah, I'll let these guys wordsmith it, but I think the. But well, we have to approve it tonight, or else it doesn't happen until June tenth. Okay, so if a party is um, at the service window um, when a second party arrives, uh, the second party shall wait outside until the first party is finished and has left the building. Uh, and then I would admit, uh, I don't know what's the right legal term to say, and so on if you're the third party. The line forms outside. Okay. I, I don't like the word party. I, I don't know what that means. One, two people? It might mean one or two people. If I went, for example, with my husband with whom I'm living and sharing yeah. everything right now, we're sheltering together. So there's no need for us to be separate from each other. Okay. So, so we could go in as a party and I don't know, say we weren't married and wanted to get married, we could go in and get married at that window together. So there's just, I don't want to limit it to one person at the window because some things that they do need two people. One right. household at a time. One household at a time, or uh, that uses household unit. Household unit. Okay, but when you go to the big Y now, they discourage more than one person per family in in a building. Yeah, but Fred, that's that's uh, largely that's the because they're, they've got a maximum capacity, sure. and if five people from the same family are in there, that's limiting the number of people who can go in there and actually shop. Okay. It's it's, it's that's to maximize numbers of, of actual shoppers as opposed to individuals. Okay. Okay. And, and I want to thank Lynn for chiming in via chat into my question. She does need to be back in the office because of elections. So she, she's advocating that, that we need to start, start to, um, yeah. We okay. open up, so I, I appreciate that feedback. Okay. Uh, hey, Brian, do well, you... So here's my suggestion. Um, here's the sentence I would um, insert right after the, the phrase each week, beginning on June 1st, 2020. And insert this sentence. If a party, where party means members of a household unit, is at the service window when a second party arrives, the second party shall wait outside until the first party is finished and has left the building. Uh, do we need to go to a third party? I, I hope it's understood. Right. Because uh, I, I can add to that third, third or... Second or more. Second or more, yeah. Okay, so I changed it to um, 
uh, is at the service window when a second or more party parties arrives. The second party shall wait outside until the first party is finished and has left the building. Does that address what you're concerned about then, John? I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Joyce, do you want to add the la in the last sentence, the assessor's office and town administrator are available by advanced appointment only? Okay, I'll write the word advanced. Yeah. Yes. In there, advanced appointment only. Okay. Maybe the same for the net, the highway to fire and water maybe too? Okay. So we'll put the word advanced basically in front of any place where it's by appointment only. Presumably they would want some advanced notice. Uh, yeah, the wording is different on police set up an appointment. I'll say in advance before coming to the police station, to the transfer station, library. Uh, um, okay, yeah, so I, there's um, two places where I put the word advanced uh, or in advance. The assessor's office and town administrator are available by advanced appointment only, highway department, fire department, water department by advanced appointment only, and then on the bullet point on the police, I put the words in advance after appointment. And the others um, don't have the word appointment specifically in them, uh, but it's like the library, they're working out their own, um, uh, uh, their own procedure about their, uh, yeah, the, the curbside drop-off. So we're not specifying what the curbside drop-off is, but we do link to the uh, uh, earlier uh, somewhere. No, I don't think it's not linked. It's linked in the other document um, about uh, they've got rules for curbside pickup that they have to follow from the state. Um, and I don't think we need yeah. to have them in here. Yeah, the state's given them yeah. some guidelines as to what they can do. Yeah, okay. Um, but they're not letting them open. Okay. So are we done with this then? Are we uh, happy with this? Can I just talk, can I just mention um, my thoughts about um, public meetings? And it sure. goes, it goes to the town hall as well. Um, and the reason I think we should keep those closed, even even small committees or boards and committees, well, a couple reasons. One, if, you know, I had the question about the finance select board meeting and so, well, it's going to be only nine people. So let's have a meeting. The issue is if, well, Aside from all the other health issues, the other issue is if two people show up and want to watch the meeting, then you can't have your meeting because you have 11 people. So everybody, everybody has to go home. Um, it, you know, the same with the town hall, that's really a meeting space and event space, which we really shouldn't be doing right now. Um, and then the other part is uh, I've had to, I've had conversations with some people about why can't we just meet in the parking lot quickly? Well, that requires somebody from the public, um, if you're not going to put it on Zoom or, or it's going to require someone from the public either not to attend your meeting or to risk, you know, exposure going to your meeting. So it, it's just, it doesn't seem right. Um, so I think until, until there's loosening of the, of the restrictions on gatherings, and I don't know what the right number is, if it's 25, if it's 50, if it's beyond that, um, I'm not really in favor of, you know, I'm not eager to jump to in-person public meetings. As much fun as this is, of course. No, oh. I, I, and I'm and I'm and I'm, I'm, frustrated. I'm frustrated that people want to do that. I mean, part of part of what we're doing here is also <clears throat> demonstrating some leadership that this is a crisis, and that um, everyone's functioning fine, and that we're going to return to in public meetings when the health experts tell us that it's okay to do so and that hasn't happened yet at least that's that's my opinion mm -hmm. and and 
And if people who want to meet have a beef with that, tell them to call me. I, you shouldn't bear the burden of this, Brian. No. Everybody's been, once I explained that, they're pretty understanding, but it's not what people jump to first. They jump to, well, we can meet in person quickly and just get our business. And I think as more people are becoming more comfortable with remote meetings, it's, it's becoming less. So. Yeah, but I knew it was going to work when I got the Ag Commission to meet on Zoom. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, really, that was a great test case, and it worked out really well. And they actually felt they got something out of it on that first meeting we had. And so I think um, I, I think it's completely reasonable to keep the buildings closed for meetings uh, because we have another option, for one. Um, and uh, because it seems to be a reasonable way to get business done, uh, there's always in our current policy the uh, the option to sort of appeal and say, "Hey, I need an in-person meeting because I've got this time-sensitive thing." And you know, somebody can make a case that they really need to meet in person. Have a way for them to to do that uh, to you know to make the case. Yeah. So. All right, so do we need to vote on this? I believe that would uh, probably make Brian feel better. So do I hear a motion on the uh, town building reopening order uh, version two as amended? Motion. Uh, I'll second it. Um, to all those in favor, John? Yep. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay, great. Um, that's uh that's one. Um, do we need, do we need to meet to sign or do we need to sign it in person sometime? Um, uh, it has room for a signature, all three signatures at the bottom. So I'm guessing yes. Is that right, John, Brian? Um, for something like this, if I mean, does that, can everybody sign and scan and email back? Oh, I can. I can for sure. Yeah, I think that would be acceptable for, for something like this. Okay. I don't and, um, know. So I will send the one with the new verbiage in it to Brian right now. Um, and maybe, oh, maybe I'll insert my signature first. <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, I can, uh, uh, I'll do that. And then you can send it on around. Yeah. Okay. All right, so now I have to find the agenda that I moved out of the way. Here we go. Uh, the next one was the directive on employee pay. Uh, make that go through May, that is going through May 27th at the moment, uh, right. today. Um, and that's not one where you sent us a new one. Nope. So. Uh, I actually don't have it up. Um, yeah. Do we that, need to continue that if, we're, if the next one is uh, passed, the emergency order restricting I'm sorry, the first one, Directive Limiting Work in Town Buildings. Um, once that's, if that's approved, then we don't need the Directive on Employee Pay anymore and we can just fail to act and that's gone, right? Oh, well, the idea is that we'd extend that through May 31st. Oh, oh okay, okay. Alrighty. Um, so let's take it up in the other order though. Uh, I think we actually did number three first, the Public Access to Town Buildings. Um, the directive limiting work in town buildings. Um, the one I think that's titled, uh, that we were sent, it was titled Directive on Town Employees Returning to Work. Yeah. Um, that was the shorter name. That's the one that has a link to the uh, mandatory safety standards for the workplace. Right. Um, so maybe we can take a look at that. Brian, do you want to share screen with that or shall I? Yep. Can you see it? Um, oh, I see it now. Yep. Yeah. I see it in two places because I have it on my other screen. Oh. Um, so would, would you summarize that then? Yeah. As we look at that. Um, yeah, I'll just, we'll just talk about the sort of the general idea here. Um, so the idea is that the employees are expected to resume working the regular number of hours beginning on June 1st, 2020. So that's why we would want the other one to go up to March 31st. Um, employees are expected to complete these hours through a combination of work in the office and work from home when possible to limit the number of people working in the town office buildings at one time. 
to allow for safe social distancing and to adhere to the 25% occupancy limitation. Um, what that refers to is there's, a, there's a, a regulation from the state that says that all offices can only be at 25% occupancy. Um, it was clarified in a call on Tuesday that that's in, for municipalities, that means offices. It doesn't mean the entire building. Um, so let's just say we have an office with four people in it. You could have one. Um, I do the easy math. <laughs> um, so that's the idea. The idea is that really that we remain extremely flexible. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have, we'll have somebody certainly in the office, um, either, either Janet or Lynn, when, when we have that four hour window, um, when the public can come in on Monday, I already forget the hours. Wednesday, Monday, and Thursday. Monday Thursday. Yeah. Um, but really at that, uh, other than that, uh, it, the idea is that it, we're going to kind of being, we're, we're going to kind of continue as we are now. Um, you know, I, I think the guidance from the state is still that people should stay home as much as possible. I don't know it's called stay at home. I think it's called safer at home. Um, so we wanted to, to Jonathan's earlier point, we wanted to provide still a lot of flexibility for for people to work from home. Um, yep. But when people do come to work, um, the state, when, when they do come to the office or wherever their work site is, because now we're talking about sort of townwide here, they need to follow the mandatory safety standards. Um, there's a link to them. One of the comments from the Board of Health was that they wanted us to highlight um, they wanted us to highlight some of these because not everybody clicks through on links, um, obviously. Yeah. Um, obviously, if you're sick, don't come to work. That's probably the most important one. Um, all employees, customers, and vendors um, must practice so safe social distancing to the greatest extent possible. There was some discussion about the greatest extent possible on, on the call with the state, and they recognize that in some situations, absolute, absolutely staying six feet apart is just not going to happen um, in certain situations. The situation with the highway department and if somebody has to ride in the same vehicle for, you know, to drop off equipment or something, you put on a mask. So they don't want to prohibit it, but they strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that people do that. And if you, if you can't do that, you have to wear a mask. Um, the guidelines, I mean, the, the safety standards say that all employees, customers, and vendors must wear a mask or face covering when inside a building. Um, and in any situation where safe social distancing cannot be practiced. And they also, the safety standards also talk about um, frequent hand washing. And there's a whole, there's probably 12 to 15 total. Um, but I think these are probably the most important ones. Um, Okay. I, and then I think the remainder of the document really spells out <clears throat> kind of office by office or department by department uh, exactly what those rules mean. Um, that I remember there were only two where work from home was not possible. That was the police and the highway department. Um, yeah. So they uh, they have special protocols required, um, and uh, for the highway department, we had talked about those and enacted those earlier. Those are not different from what we already uh, had allowed, if I recall. Um, there There's no loosening. Yeah, they're pretty much the same. The one that I took off, um, it was about managing work on rainy days. Um, because now we're not paying people their regular hours. Um, my understanding is that they can find them work to do that still keeps that safe social distancing. They'll be wearing masks, yeah. um, but it gives them the opportunity to earn their full pay. Okay.
but it's yeah, it's essentially the same. The transfer station, um, the Board of Health has their protocols. Um, library, you know, I've seen a draft of the, the special protocols for the curbside pickup and drop off. I provided my comments um, and I also forwarded to Fran Fortino from the Board of Health for his comments. Um, I had some additional ideas that maybe it doesn't need to be brought out to people's cars. Um, mm. They can just leave the books on the table or on the, the steps of the library or whatever other material and go back inside. I don't, yeah. I don't know that they need that close contact, but I think curbside means something different in rural areas as it does to city. Yeah. So. And it may be patron, like if there's an elderly patron, they may yep. want to save them the effort and go to the car. But that, yeah, I, I think that's enough to let I think they're sensible enough to decide that. Yeah. As, yeah. Yeah. My preference is that they keep as much space as possible. And if they can be inside the building and stay inside the building when somebody comes, that's even better. Yeah. Um, and I know there's guidelines from the state about when they receive materials back, they need to put it in a special area and leave it for 72 hours before it can be recirculated. Mm-hmm. I wonder whether there needs to be some system put in place, I and mean, they may have already thought about it. They're smart people um, for notification. So if you're dropping off a book or a series of books at a table that's set up, um, have a, a a a a text line, a cell phone that someone can text and say, "I just left three books out front," so that the library person isn't constantly peering out the window waiting for for books to be returned, that there is there is some notification policy because that'll maximize social distancing as well. Yeah, I, I think for drop-offs, I think they're going to continue to use the existing Dropbox. What about um, pick for, for pickup, yeah, their system is, they're going to have to um, call the library, uh, call or email the library, and when the material is ready, the, the librarian will call. Um, we'll call or email them that their material is ready to be picked up. And okay. hopefully that there's a certain window of time that they give them to pick it up. Yeah. Yeah, where is that email? Um, my understanding is Tritown Beach will not open to the public um, for the 2020 season. They're still planning on, on ma uh, continuing maintenance there. Does that include, and they may have already, there, there's, there aren't, there's not going to be a, um, a summer camp run this summer, is there? I don't believe so, no. Okay. But I, they did not say that specifically. Right, I just, because that, that may be a different definition of open to the public if there was a camp, because that camp does use the River Valley camp that's run by the district, does use... Yeah the Tritown Beach on a, it used to be a regular basis. I don't know whether it still is or not, but we should at least be aware of, of what, what's going on there. And there's also requirements, there's a, there's a number of um, posters that we need to post and um, obviously we'll have signs about wearing masks and stuff like that. I mean, we'll post those in each of the, of the public buildings. And those are from, this, from the Commonwealth. Right. I don't see anything that I would want to change about this document. Fred and John, do you see anything that you think you need to add to it or um, amend of what you're reading there? I'm fine. Oh, it looks, it looks fine to me. Okay, okay, great. Well, then, then maybe we should put this to a vote. Do I hear a motion? Motion to approve. Second. All right, all those in favor? John? Yeah. Fred? Yes. Choice, yes. 
Okay, great. Um, all right, and then, so now that that is passed, let's go to the Directive on Employee Pay. Um, would I hear a motion to extend the Directive on Employee Pay through May 31st, 2020? Motion. motion. Second. All those in favor? John? Yeah. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yep. Okay, great. So that was item A under COVID-19. There's an item B and the item C. Item B is to discuss any updates to the annual town election or annual town meeting. So maybe I should um, see, Lynn, are there any um, updates you'd like to mention about the annual town election? Um, not really, except the interesting thing is I've had I'm not quite sure, somewhere between 140 and 150 applications for early voting, yeah. which is actually more than voted in the last two town elections. So <laughs> I'm expecting that my in-person voting will be relatively few. Okay. Well, that's what we were going for. So I'm happy to see voter turnout, voter turnout might actually increase. Well, the only issue I am having is um, finding some election workers. Um, oh. My regular election workers uh, have, indic well, I've sent them an email and left it up to them on whether they wanted to participate. Um, given that most of them are in the more vulnerable age group, um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that most of them um, most of them have indicated to me that they did not want to work this particular particular election. Um, so I right think. now I have three and I need two more. So if anyone out there is listening, please give me a call. Um, anyone who's a registered voter can be an election worker. Um, and I can also accept um, teens that are between 16 and 18 that aren't registered voters. Oh, okay. so if anyone's interested, give me a call. Okay. If you are on the ballot, are you allowed to be an election worker? Uh, that is not. I would be really proud allowed. Of yeah. I would say okay. Okay. Be, All right. That'd be interesting. <clears throat> and and <laughs> this is a volunteer position, correct? Um, people get paid minimum wage. Oh. Um. Okay. The disadvantage to this election is because normally I have a family style meal and I cook for everybody. But in this situation, I'm asking everyone to bring their lunch. I don't know whether that has lunch and dinner. I don't know if that has anything to do with not getting election workers or not. Because uh, that really is the primary thing that people go for, I think. People so. do tend yeah. to like the food, but. I just didn't want to risk that at this election. So people will have to bring their own meals, but. We, we, um, we can't front money for, for uh, takeout? Well, I'm just afraid of the actual process of going and getting your meal and stuff like that. So, I mean, I suppose yeah. I could do takeout and have sandwiches that have wrapped and everything so that there wouldn't be the whole issue of, you yeah. know, buffets and that kind of stuff are frowned upon and um, right. yeah. so I, I think it's safer to ask people to bring their own meals. So Lynn, how many people are we talking about that will actually be in the building <laughs> for the election? For the election, I need two people to um, for one for check-in, one for check-out, one for the ballot box, a clerk and a warden, um, plus the constable. So there's six people. I have gotten a waiver that I only need one person at check-in and one person at check-out. Um, so I've gotten, I've got three people. I need three more. I also would like to have someone as a greeter when people arrive at the school, just to indicate, you know, ask them the questions about whether they're feeling well today and, um, you know, just go through that whole thing. You're gonna be able to vote, but with, this is how the procedure in which you're gonna have to vote. Um, just explain that to the people. So in all, I would need seven people. 
Is this greeter going to be outside or inside? I would have them at the entrance to the school. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, this is on FCAT, so you got a little bit of advertising there. Well, that's what I'm and hoping we, for. <laughs> and we can uh, maybe, I don't know, there's other media people here on the call. Maybe they could mention something about our need for um, some uh, young, and, and definitely that it pays some money. <laughs> will probably help. I'm sure there's a lot of people having trouble getting jobs that Mike could use, you know, uh, a day's worth of wages. Even yeah, and it probably wage. wouldn't even affect their, um, if they're on unemployment, the amount that they would make is minimum wage. Um, so it right. probably that's would like not a, affect their unemployment anyway. Yeah. So and that's like a six hour period? Uh, well, it's 12 to six, but then they would also have to stay to count ballots. Okay, so. So it's probably more of an eight hour Probably an eight hour commitment. Yeah. Okay. So and 16 is the minimum age? Yes. I can have two people that are under the age of 18 that are not registered voters. Okay. That are 16 to 18. They have to be 16. Okay. And is there till, is there still time to vote by mail? There is still time to vote by mail. Um, they just have to think about how long it takes for me to mail the ballot to them and then to either deliver or mail the ballot back. They can deliver it to the um, after hours box if they so choose. Um, they can also deliver it. It has to be at the town offices by the end of poll at six, six o'clock on June 9th. I have to have all the ballots received. Okay, so somebody delivering a ballot on June 9th can still deliver it to the after hours box at Poor Sandy Lane. That's going to get yes. checked. Yes. Yep. And then up until six o'clock. Up until six o'clock. Okay. All right. Even though the election's happening at the school, just in case. Oh, that's confusing. right. But the, yes, I will run down and check the back, the box. Right. It's not that far from. from no. To, uh, to the school. It reminds me of the days when we were at town hall in the center school, running back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. And do okay. all your workers have to be Waitley residents? Actually, they don't. So if I do run into a bind, I have, um, I can request people from other towns. And I know that some of my fellow town clerks might be willing to step in to uh, help out. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lynn. Yep. Um, and then updates on the annual town meeting. Um, well, three of the four people who were on the brainstorming call this morning are here. Um, I'll summarize as best I can, and then maybe Brian and Lynn can chime in and set, pick up on things that I missed from, if I missed anything important from the meeting. Um, I think basically um, from our last conversation, we were considering the using the elementary school, using the gym with the cafeteria's overflow, that there appeared to be enough space for about 140 people, and we typically get 120. Uh, plus a few um, like out of town employees and usually two or three people from the school district. So we were, we think that the indoor option is, uh, is viable, but um, we uh, were asked to actually consider some outdoor venues and that's what many of the other towns are doing. So um, a lot of what we did this morning on our little brainstorming call was uh, try to figure out, well, if we're going to do it outdoors in Waitley, where would we do that and what would we need to do? So uh, looking at, uh, well, looking at kind of what we have, it seemed like the, um, the best outdoor option for us might be to use the little field that's uh, across from the front entrance of the school. Um, and if it's okay, maybe I'll do a, a little share screen because I have a map um, that I came up with. Uh, let's see, my iPhone, there we go, iPad. Uh, I'll share that. Alrighty, so can you see the the map that I have there? Yeah. Yep. Um, and I, I marked it up a bit. This is just a Google map. 
Um, and so if you're familiar with the school coming in the driveway, um, and I, something's covering up a bit of the driveway there, but um, let me use, uh, I'll use the red marker. So when you're coming in the driveway this way, uh, the school is on your right, and there's that loop, and then to the right of that loop is a field that's about 100 feet by 200 feet. And, yeah, that's about right. And if we um, uh, if we go and figure out like how many six foot diameter circles you could fit in there, even with an extra foot separation, we can fit somewhere uh, in the region of 400 people there. So we could have more than much more than six foot spacing um, out on that area of lawn. Uh, one of the things we would need, though, is electricity. Um, so I went over and checked out possibilities for electricity. Um, there is a light post um, right here where I'm putting the star. There's a light post there, and um, there's uh, on that light post is a little, it's not really an outlet, but it's something that might be able to be turned into an outlet in short order. Um, so we may look into that. Um, but we've also got, we're about 220 feet from the building where there's an outlet here to the right of the main door. There's another outlet to the left of the main door. There's actually a third outlet over here near the kindergarten window. Um, so there's a few different outlets. Um, I, I talked to Darius today and he's going to figure out who can walk me through the building to make sure there's enough um, power available on those outlets. Because there are some outlets in the school where when you plug in the coffee maker, the breaker goes, and those are largely in the cafeteria. But um, I want to make sure that there's um, enough, uh, enough power available. Um, uh, Frontier was very happy to help us out with extension cords and that sort of thing. Uh, because I think they have a lot of those. They need them at, um, you know, at graduation and such. So... Um, even if we can't do anything about getting electricity from that light post there, um, we can run some uh, power cables from the school building. Um, we need something upwards of 200 feet. Um, and that would be crossing a road where people would be driving by to get up to the parking lot uh, over here. And then they'll of course be parking along the side mm -hmm. as people normally do. So we may need to look into, and I haven't asked the highway department yet if they have something like this, but something where we could run cables underneath something that cars can drive over. I don't know if our department has one, but I imagine that if anybody knows where to get one, they would know where to get one. Um, I did find out that generally speaking, when they do this at Frontier for the graduation, they rent a sound system. And that rental includes the people setting it up and making sure that it works. They gave me the names of two places they've worked with. Um, one is a, a local kid who I actually happen to know because he used to work at FCAT when I was still um, on their board. Uh, and then the other name is also another local vendor. And then we also have Wasp and Audio right around the corner. So um, I think the next step is to kind of be in touch and see who has equipment that can, that can fill up that field uh, appropriately with sound. Um, and that would be uh, an option. So um, the other thing we discussed at our meeting was that, well, if we plan for, uh, right now we're looking at June 23rd, but if it rains, right? right. So you pick in advance as many rain dates as you want to pick, really. You can say, but if it's raining on June 23rd, we're going to continue it to June 24th. And if it's raining on June 24th, we're going to continue it to the 25th. And we just keep going. I hope it won't rain completely between June 23rd and June 30th. Uh, that would be a risk involved here with it, trying to have it outdoors, which is a risk we would not have if we were doing it indoors. It's just the risks indoors are, are, are different. There's a um, probably there's, you know, more risk that people would not follow social distancing, for example. Um, you know, getting 100 people into and out of a building at safe distances um, is a, an, another risk. Um, and I don't have a good idea for which is better, but it seemed like the health department liked the idea of having it outdoors. 
Uh, and Deerfoot plans to do it where they ask people to bring their own chairs, but I can't imagine that everyone will have chairs, so we may have to have some chairs on hand, but the school has stacks and stacks of chairs. So um, we'd have to arrange to uh, sanitize them afterwards. Um, the other thing we would have to do if we were to move it outdoors is we would likely want to move the time, the start time to 6 p.m. instead of 7 p.m. Uh, on the 23rd, uh, someone looked up that the sunset is around 8.25 or call it 8.30 plus or minus. And town meeting generally takes at least two hours. Uh, so if we can keep our agenda moving, um, we start at six and we end at eight. Um, or if it gets to eight and we still have too much to do, we can always continue. Um, but th that would be sort of the desired time interval. Um, so we wouldn't want to wait till seven to start because that would give us a really short time interval with uh, appropriate light so that people can read whatever they're looking at in front of them. Um, let me see, so the time change, the making rain dates in advance so people know what to expect if there is um, rain. Um, I feel like there's something else I'm forgetting. Brian or Lynn, is there something that you can think of that I'm uh, forgetting? What, what other locations have you considered? Well, for about, uh, for a little while we considered just, you could use the track at Frontier, but you have many of the same logistical problems and it's in another town. Uh, you know, people's feelings for the elementary school are different than their feelings for Frontier. Um, and I think keeping it closer to home is better for as far as getting good attendance and um, getting people to come. I think this site is better for wheelchair access because it's, it's really flat going from that uh, the loop on that parking lot, um, there is no grade whatsoever. Uh, when you're going from Frontier's parking lot onto the football field, there is not just a grade, but you're going through a lot of grass to get there. And that's hard on the wheelchair bound and for people who maybe aren't bound to wheelchairs, but are using walkers and so on. Um, that's kind of tough on them. Um, we did think about um, uh, access for uh, I'd say wheelchair and, um, well, I don't know what's the, I, I'll probably say it badly, <laughs> but, you know, people who have mobility problems but are not bound to wheelchairs, uh, I think we have our, we have our police, we have people who know their community really well, who could be, um, you know, stationed at, uh, say, this part of the loop and this part of the loop and allow those people to park along these edges and be able to have closer access to the meeting um, so they won't have to walk quite as far. And I don't know where to make that cutoff, but we, our police do know our community. Uh, and anybody could be dropped off here, say, at the entrance to the loop. Um, we'd have to sort out things like, well, when you're going into the meeting and you want to vote, you have to go by the town clerk's table so we would have to do, you know, signage and maybe cones or something like that. Um, and we'd have to, so we have to think about traffic flow into the meeting um, for voting privileges. But I think that's a problem that is solvable. Um, so I feel like what we came out of our brainstorming session with was another alternative for us to consider that um, it would, I mean, both locations, either indoors or outdoors, have extra work associated with them um, and perhaps some extra cost associated with renting a, a sound system uh, for the outdoors, whereas the indoors we have the built-in sound system. Um, I, I mean, the more we talked about it, the more I thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool to have town meeting outside? Um, and that I'm trying not to let my own personal enthusiasm for having a town meeting outdoors take over, um, but um, that's kind of where we left it. We wanted to look into things like um, how much will a sound system cost? I don't have a dollar value for that yet. Um, but I do now have vendors to contact. Uh, and it, it does seem feasible uh, that we can get enough electricity out there to operate uh, uh, speakers and microphones and the kinds of things that we would need to operate. Um, can I make a couple comments? Sure. 
And I, and I admit my comments may dampen your enthusiasm or my tone may, because I'm not convinced that I'm supportive of this. Um, I think that um, mosquitoes are gonna drive people away starting at about 6.30 to seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a real issue. I also think that um, it makes a video presentation very challenging because of light. We would not be able to do a video presentation. Right, we wouldn't. So, so that makes the finance committee presentation uh, difficult from their norm. Um, yeah. I think that I think that sound could be an issue regardless because if you if the goal by doing it outside is to maximize the social distancing, I just if it's windy at all, if it's you know. It, what happens if a if if there's any noise distraction? I think it's going to be hard for people to hear. I know outside graduations work, but I also know that a lot of people leave graduation saying I couldn't hear a thing. They had a wonderful time, but they couldn't hear a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I I just if we know that the gym can with social within social distancing guidelines. Uh, tolerate 140 people with the overflow capacity in the, in the cafeteria. I don't see why we're why we're going outside because of the factors that I just mentioned. I think it makes it challenging. Yeah. Yep. Fred, what do you uh, think? My my comments, and I, I think I keep bringing it up, is is looking at Quan Quad Farms. Uh, yeah, yeah. Brooklyn is not is is not bigger than our gym, and so well, it would not a, be a hundred. They have an outside pavilion. Okay, it's not probably bigger than a gym, and I don't know if it's a hundred by two hundred, but it's outdoors, so you you could get some people there, and their their main it's connected kind of to their main building with a patio it's outdoors, and I think their main building. It's been a while since I've, I've been in it. It has doors that open up on two or three sides, at least two sides. It's all open. So you can get the, the full open view and, and most seating if you use the whole area. And I'm sure they're, they have electricity, say, at the pavilion or outside for all their activities that, that, that go on there. Well, would you be willing to investigate that? I mean, and because I think the last time when we had the people from Quan Quan here in the room, their building was no bigger than just the gymnasium. Okay, right. not the gymnasium plus the cafeteria, but just the gymnasium, which wouldn't quite handle the 120 people. Okay, I'll if you I'll go there if you want me to look into it. I think that yeah, if if you if you would look into it, then that would be something to consider. Okay. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind. I don't know the the square footage we have, but at our town offices right now, you've got the parking lot there, and you've got some grass area to the west. Hmm. Is all that area enough to hold, say, the hundred hundred twenty people? Um, I can probably do a quick calculation. Um, if you give me a minute with Google Maps. Hey, Fred, I have a question for you, though. If, and again, my opposition is not to this specific site, but but my concern is, and it's not opposition, it's concern about an outdoor venue at all. I, what, what don't you think works if we were to choose to go outside? What doesn't work with this location? Because it's a very large location. Yeah. There's ample parking. So if we're outside, I think this works. I just, I'm not sure outside works logistically. Well, you you mentioned the the mosquitoes and and well, mosquitoes are going to be outside regardless of where we are. Right. I mean, well, I'm I'm not sure. I I, I guess Quanquah Farms has has dealt with that somehow. That's not a concern to them. I guess otherwise they wouldn't be in a business. Uh, tables, chairs, whatever. I, I guess you need you need to accommodate that. Here at the school, where they could say, "Okay, Quanqua, you probably wouldn't. They may have all that there available." 
I, I don't know. I, I think it's a, it, it's a lot of work to have it here at the school site. If it comes down to that's, that's the only thing that's reasonable, yeah. th then I guess, okay, yeah, I'll go with it. But, but I, I, I guess I would like to pursue other, the other locations still. We have time, okay. I guess. We've got another. Yeah. Uh, a quick check on, um, on uh, Google Maps. The uh, parking lot, and maybe if you spill into the grassy areas on the side, are yeah. roughly the same size as the 100 by 200 area at the school. So square footage is roughly equivalent to those two places. Um, the thing that's not equivalent is, I don't think we have uh, a bunch of chairs. And where would, if you're using the parking lot for the meeting, where do people park at Four Sandy Lane? Well, they'd be on, on Sandy Lane or all the way down Sandy Lane, I guess. Well, you, okay. So that I, I think that's making people walk a lot farther. Well, yeah. Then uh, they would have to walk from the school parking lot to the field or from the driveway approaching the school to that field. Um, so I think logistically, while the square footage is not an issue, I don't think, at Fort Sandy Lane. It's what do we do with the cars? Because we don't have great other places to put the cars um, for Fort Sandy. So I don't see that as having a, a lot of advantage over the school okay. um, for logistics. Okay. Where would you get the chairs for the school? We use the They're in the gymnasium right now on little roller carts. You can roll them out 10 at a time. Okay. And you can also encourage people to bring their own sun chairs. Uh, a lot of people have them for, you know, in their backyard. So they can, uh, that's what Deerfield is doing, is encouraging people to bring chairs uh, so that they can minimize the number of chairs that they have to haul out of Frontier. And they're more comfortable. Yeah, for many people, that's going to be more comfortable to have yeah. their own chair. Yeah. Okay, can that's I make a comment? It's uh, Lynn. Sure. sure, go ahead then. Um, has any thought, I understand Jonathan's concern about the mosquitoes. Has any thought been maybe to change the date to a Saturday and do it during the day? Mm, it gives us fewer rain dates. It does give us fewer rain dates. Um, but there are plenty of towns that do their town meeting on a Saturday. Is it legal to hold a town meeting on a Sunday? We used to, that's when I, we always had town meeting years ago. Right. Um, but on, on Sundays, is it, like, could Sunday be a rain date? Um, I'm not sure that Sunday would be an appropriate rain date, but yeah. I mean, you could move it back to the 21st and have two Saturdays. Yeah. As options. Or um, 20th, 20th, right? Yeah. Or the 20th or whatever. Yeah. Um, but also, um, I think there's a lot of resistance at the school for using the school. Yeah, there um, was when I yeah when I first suggested that they uh, help me figure out how how big a tarp I need to get, they were kind of like, "Whoa, have you thought about doing it outdoors?" So so yes, that is one of the reasons we started considering outdoors because the schools themselves were nervous about using the. Uh, uh, about using the school property for for that. Are they worried about the new gym floor? Is that their concern? Oh, no, I was asking them about, hey, can I order tarps in advance so I have enough to cover that best floor in Western Mass? And no, I think their concern was whether you would be able to do appropriate social distancing and if by some means 140 people actually showed up, um, it yeah. would be a very tight situation. And I think that was their concern. Which we all know that 140 people aren't going to show up, but I guess. That is true. Right. And I think, I think throughout this whole thing, uh, Fran doesn't come out and say exactly, you have to do this yeah. from the Board of Health standpoint, but that was the closest I've kind of seen him say that. Yeah. We're exactly. talking about the annual town meeting. The Board of Health talked about it, I believe it was yesterday, and I, I don't think they are comfortable with it being inside the gymnasium. 
I think practicing social distancing is going to be hard in 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 this set in any setting anyway. I think that it's going to be very difficult to get people to not have conversations in close proximity to each other as hard as we might encourage people to be smart about this. I I, I just think as more and more people show up, it, it is going to become a social atmosphere because people haven't seen each other in so long. And I don't know how to fight that. I, I, I so I, you know, I, I guess the concern about can you do social distancing in the gym, I don't think there's that much big a difference between gym and outside because of just natural human need to interact. Well, I can't really speak for the Board of Health, but I think the difference between the gym and outside is the, uh, the airflow. Right, absolutely. And, and that, I mean, that's not only a science-based thing. Um, I think mosquitoes can, you know, we warn people in advance to use some mosquito repellent. Well, I, I, I think you lose people. I really do. You might, but you know, we're, we might lose people if we're in the gym. So either either location, are we going to mark off or designate the six foot, or where people can sit to be socially distant? I think that would be easier in the gym because we could actually put little pieces of tape down on the tarp. Right. Um, I think you. In the I field, think you could probably <laughs> use that. Um, you know what they use on the fields and mark out on the field as well. Yeah, because yeah, that'll grow in two weeks anyway. So there's nothing yeah. about that. Right. Okay. And is is the the area? Speaking of the school again, the playground area between the school and Long Plain Road is that. Is that size of that? Well, that size of that is big enough. Um, there's big a, enough? A, a bigger, the bigger problem there is accessibility. It's all fenced in, as you know. Um, right. The place where you can enter there is kind of a, a steep slope going down. So that would be uh, difficult for wheelchair access and probably for people who are kind of mobility impaired in, uh, you know, in walkers is they're gonna have trouble uh, going down that slope to get into the green area. Uh, it also puts the temptation the playground choice? right there in front of everybody who might, you know, you know, people who may bring their children with them to a town meeting. Uh, I'd have a hard time tell, you know, telling my six and eight year olds that they can't go over and play on those swings right over there where mom can see them. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the playground is technically closed. So uh, if we're over in that part of the field, I think that would be a bigger problem. It may still be a problem, but it would be a problem whether we're in the gym, whether we're in the field, yeah. um, whichever field we're in. Um, but we, it, at least we can, if people are really supposed to be over in this field, maybe, I don't know, the great thing about six and eight year olds is they're easily distracted and you can maybe get them to forget there's a playground over there. Well, Joyce, but by, by, by the end of June, I'm not sure the playground is going to be closed any longer. I mean, we don't know, but that's, mm -hmm. that's oh. possible. It could be that it's not closed, and then that would be great because then, um, you know, people can uh, have their kids over there. That was one of the great things to get town meeting attendants up in the past has been offering childcare in the after school room, and um, they used the playground for that. I remember the first time we did that. Okay, I'll I'll look into what Quad Quad Farms has and, and get Brian some information to share with with you. Mm -hmm. Hopefully before our next meeting. Yeah. So our next meeting, I think, is um, June tenth, okay. um, where we'll presumably reorganize the board based on the results of the election. I think we should really try and have a firm decision at that point. Okay. So I'll make sure I gather board. information we'll about the cost yeah. of town systems and try to anticipate any um, any other costs and logistical concerns um, and I'll focus on the school either the indoor or the outdoor options for the school and Fred if you'll do similarly for Quan Quan I'm guessing a sound system cost is not going to be different for outdoors at the school compared to outdoors at Quan Quan um, but but mainly being able to accommodate um, a number of people between 
you know, uh, we're kind of using 120 as our number, but if it's bigger than that, that would be good. How would you accommodate 150 um, people, say? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there any further discussion of uh, annual town meeting? I mean, for what it's worth, the Deerfield, Sunderland, and Conway are all doing theirs outside. Yeah. Open air town meetings. At, where, at like ball fields or? No. Oh. Deerfield is doing theirs at the Frontier uh, track. Same place as graduation happens. Okay. Um, I don't remember yep. for Sunderland and Conway. Do you happen to know, Brian? Um, I'd have to look it up, but it's yeah, it's open air enough. I presume there it's either a park or a field. Yeah. Yeah, they've got a good field over at Sunderland Elementary, I think, that they can use, and um, probably at Conway uh, Conway Grammar School. I think Sunderland's is behind their town office building. Oh, that's a great field. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, well, let's go to our next item um, under COVID-19 is to discuss whether to issue tag sale permits during the COVID-19 state of emergency. Um, I have not heard anything pro or con on this. I'm wondering if Brian or Lynn have uh, uh, any concerns about this or um, can give us any information that would be helpful. I had asked the, the Board of Health for what they had thought. Um, and what, what Fran had gotten back to me, it's kind of outdated now, but um, he said that we should ask to keep them delayed until June minimal, minimally. Um, it, it, I don't, I don't know that Well, the building's been closed, so I don't know that we've had any requests. Um, but they just had, con I guess the Board of Health had concerns about whether social distancing is going to take place and the exchange of money and all those types of things that we're really trying to discourage at this point. And I don't think it's part of phase one. Probably not, I think. Hmm. Well, let me ask Joyce, is the 250th committee planning a townwide bride sale this year? Not to my knowledge. If they do, it would not be till September. That is when they tended to do it. Is that when it was the That's year? That's when it September? was last time, yeah. I think we should wait for a couple of weeks on this. I think there's going to be, with, with phase two guidance coming out, Roughly in the next couple of weeks, I would imagine. I think we're going to have more information. And I think we should yeah. just wait. Yeah, I do feel a little information back in here. So it sounds like we should punt this until, um, and we can reconsider it at our next meeting. Um, and when we may have more information from the state, or we may have, I don't know, 11 angry people showing up in our Zoom meeting who want to have their tag sales. I don't know. So right now we will not issue them. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So is that something we have to make a positive vote on, or an affirmative sort of vote? Um, it 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 would be helpful, I guess. Okay. Amy will uh, deal the deal with the brunt of all the angry people. So. Oh. Okay. All right. Um, all right I'll make a motion not to extend uh, tag sale permits, uh, at least for the next two weeks. Second. All those in favor, John. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yep. Okay. All right. So we have a, just a couple more items under uh, old business and uh, then a, a new business. So old business uh, is to discuss the options selected for Waitley Municipal Aggregation Program and next steps. So let me turn that over to Brian because you're the one who turned in the actual paperwork. Yep. So on May 20th, the 13 town collaborative received what, what's called executable pricing for uh, the municipal aggregation. 
So what that means for Waitley is that um, residents now have a choice on who their um, electricity provider will be. The way that the program works is that anybody on basic service, currently on basic service, which means you get your electricity from Eversource, um, will be um, will be given a different default provider that I'll talk about in a second. There's also the option if people have selected a different electricity provider that they could they could um, also join the program and select one of these options. And there'll be a lot more uh, public outreach on this. Um, but the pricing was very favorable. So for the default product, uh, the town selected um, Dynagy. It's, it's the ones that we talked about at the last meeting, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the pricing was very similar. Dynagy, which is National Wind Rex, 100% green product, will be the default product. And the beginning rate was... Um, 8.798. Yeah. And then right going to 9.331 on January 1st. Yep. Yeah. And then the two optional products was was the mass class one Rex, the RPS plus 25%. And that was um, starting at um, 0.09649. And I don't have the... Yeah. 10.19 uh, uh, or well, 0.0109. One and, then the, and then the last one was 100% um, mass class one Rex, and that was starting at uh, 0.12466 for the for the five month term. Yeah. And I don't. I don't. And then 13.032 for the uh, for January 1st and beyond. Right. So the default product, the National Wind Rex, is cheaper than. It's cheaper than the three-year uh, Eversource basic rate, and I, I believe it's cheaper than the current Eversource rate. So mm -hmm. people who are swapped into that will should see an automatic savings immediately. Um, people who are currently receiving Eversource basic service will receive a uh, postcard in the mail, and there'll be other outreach that the town will do. Um, so we'll have to be on the lookout for that. But it would spend a long process. I think the town started this in 2014 was the original town meeting vote. Um, mm -hmm. And then there was the, the really the false start with the Hampshire Power Group, which doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this, we'll be working with Colonial Power. That's um, who has been assisting this 13 town collaborative for the outreach efforts. Um, There'll be a, so just to clarify, I know we've talked about this before. Everybody's still going to be serviced by Eversource. Um, you get, I think we get that question a lot is, is it going to change? Is Eversource now going to become national grid or is Dynagy going to be coming, you know, and fixing my lines when they fall? Um, Eversource is still doing the, the, just the distribution and transmission for well, the distribution. Um, it's just going to change one piece on the bill, which is your who this electricity is actually being provided by. Um, I think Colonial is targeting June 12th, I think, for the mailing, and there's going to be a 30 day opt out period. So, the way it works is if you get a postcard that says you're on Eversource basic service, you're going to be switched to the, to the default product that the town has selected unless you make, unless you take in an affirmative action to select a different product. Um, or I think you could also opt out and stay with Eversource basic service, I believe. Um, Brian, can this information go above the fold on the website? Yep. Yeah, so what, what we're expecting, what we're expecting from Colonial is that they're supposed to send us final proofs for the, uh, for the mailing, which, which we'll see before it goes out. Uh, they're supposed to provide us with public service announcement for the local cable channels. Um, they're supposed to provide us with the frequently asked questions for the town website, um, postings for social media, um, opt-in instructions, article for local newspaper. I know there's talk about doing a, if we do a group article or a town article. Um, and 
uh, sample Eversource build before and after enrollment in an aggregation. So if if the if the mailing goes out June 12th, I think so 30 days from June 12th, um, and I think the goal was to start the program August 1, I believe. Yep. Um, one of the things that one of the things that I think we need to talk about is typically Colonial would come out and we'd have you know one or two information session in person information session uh, sessions with Colonial Power. They can answer people's questions. Obviously, that's not going to happen. Um, so I guess we'll, maybe we should put together this outreach plan and and just kind of tie it all together, but. I would think some of that is going to, some of that we're going to want to be, I don't know if it's a Zoom meeting or Google Hangout or whatever we want to do, um, where we could have colonial reps answer people's questions. Um, or we could have the energy committee do it. We had talked about having the uh, chair of the energy committee lead a webinar on this yep. um, that would be open to the general public. Um, I also think that it should be, uh, we should utilize town meeting as an explanation for this as well. Understanding that that would need to be very brief because of all the reasons we talked about half an hour ago. Um, Could we make written material available at town meeting? I absolutely. And I think yeah, yeah. And I think Colonial Power can do that because they can do it with, with a lot of slick, right. very nice marketing graphics, et cetera. Right. But, it, but honestly, I think the Colonial Power strength has not been explaining this to ordinary people. <laughs> no, I, I agree, Joyce. I guess my point is that we can, we can deliver the content and Colonial Power can put together, their, can, can use our suggested content to use their production facilities to make very nice. Um, yeah, or, or we can print it up ourselves. Uh, yeah, but I, I think it needs to look like. I think something signed by the energy committee, which is you, Nat and Paul is going to hold a lot more sway and it's going to be a better explain. I'm just thinking of our last selectman's meeting when Nat got on and explained and some people who were on that meeting had worked like had been confused about this from the beginning and then at the end it was kind of like oh now i uh, now i get it i think we may be able to do a better job of this i ourselves. couldn't agree more I, i'm just saying that if i am happy to, to design it um it's not going to look like a non-profit mailer it's going to look like a slick madison avenue thing but colonial power has the the the, the money to produce it yeah, I, I guess I, I don't think it needs to be a slick Madison Avenue thing. I, I, I guess I do. I, I, I get so tired of the nonprofit look. It just, it just, it just makes me cringe. The, the, the comment I have, yeah, this is, is for Whaley residents, but there's also, what, 12 other communities that are buying into this? And mm -hmm. it's not that it matters what others are doing, but isn't Colonial Power somebody uh, managing all of this, how they informing all these other communities and all these people? And whether it's each individual community by itself or they do in groups or, or uh, towns or, or meetings on online. Somewhere? Town by town. Should we be able to, should we find out what they're actually doing before we do our own thing? Fred, I think we should find out, but I think Joyce is right when she points out that Colonial Power's uh, forte is not um, is 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 not uh, marketing and and uh, educational delivery. I mean, they were good at getting us good prices. Right. right. They were good at understanding what we wanted and making sure that products we were interested in were available to us. Right. Um, Okay. But even on their own call, even uh, other people from other towns, energy committees who were on the call are still confused about what's going on. And we do not, I guess it matters, but the other towns have this 
communities have the same pricing as we see here? Um, they have, there were other choices they could make. I'm sure there are some who made the same choices that we did. Right. And I'm sure there are some who may have made different choices than we did. Um, the only thing we all had to do was pick from the same company. Right. Okay. And Dynagy had something like 10 or 11 different options uh, available in that list. And towns were asked to pick one as a default and one or two as opt-ins. Right, okay. And so some towns may have picked, a lot, I think a lot of towns picked the same default that we did. Okay. I, I don't have their information, but I think because that is a really good price right. and it's uh, and it's arguably 100% green. Right. And, and who wants to, you know, for uh, actually a cost that would be higher because uh, uh, Eversource will go higher for the six winter months Right. Who wants to pay more to burn more coal, right? So, so, so whatever option residents pick here for the first, say, five months, will that automatically continue for the next three years, or are they going to have to take another action? No, you pick once at the beginning, and, and it goes through. So you, the price changes on January 1st, right. and that's, uh, that new price is there for the three-year period. We get a, a little advantage for the, because in the summer, the energy is cheaper. Right. So we get that discount, you know, through December. And then once we get to winter pricing, which is January 1st, then our, our average price goes up, but we get that same price year round. And even that average price is way lower than the, um, than the three year or the five year average for ever source right and we got very lucky because we got yeah. pricing that was impacted by by, by covid distancing and, yeah. and lack of activity so now as, as we all know energy yeah. prices have, have dropped because of, of of covid um so in that from that lens um we got we got we got lucky i mean in the grand scheme of things i wish we hadn't gotten lucky because of that but we got lucky because of that yeah So I, I have no problem putting together the 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 the, the flyer. Um, yeah. Okay. I think we should try to put something together I, for, I just, you know, for town meeting. Is, it, do we uh, have have uh, is is the schedule our friend for the scoop? As an um, well, the scoop. Well, the, for our ordinary schedule. Um, no, the next one wouldn't go out till September, but the, the bulk mailing permit is valid year round. It would be putting out a special edition of the total cost, depending on how many pages. If it were a two pager, um, it's, let's see, the usual four page one is about total $400 printing plus postage. If it were smaller, the printing is actually the bigger the cost. So it might be closer to 200 to do a townwide mailing under the banner of the scoop, special edition, electricity aggregation information. Um, so it would be pretty uh, pretty cheap to put something out to the whole town. Well, I'm gonna, tomorrow, and I'll probably need to be reminded like 25 times, um, I can call Colonial and find out if they will cover the cost of any of this uh, marketing and outreach because my intent would be to have it a uh, four four color thing which is going to drive up the cost dramatically in terms of printing but mm -hmm. I, I think it needs to be be well done and i'm and i'm thinking the colonial is going to pick up the tab but i could be sadly disappointed i realize mm -hmm. so so these prices that they gave us here that brian shared with us we've actually accepted these Yep. Yes. The town has accepted these, so this is this is the final prices we're going to get. Yeah, correct. Agreed to. Okay, and what is the absolute end date for people to decide here? Um, I guess thirty days from June tenth. If the postcards go out on June tenth, they've got till July tenth. Yep. Okay. What's what, what's the June tenth date? That's the date that they would mail out postcards to every Eversource customer who's on the basic plan. 
And then they've got 30 days to either opt out or opt into one of the more expensive plans. So you got July 1st, okay, so. Brian, can you find out if, because I assume they're gonna mail this bulk permit, which is, you know, three to seven days delivery. Um, yep. Can you find out if the 30, if the clock starts to tick on that 30 days from the time that it hits the mail, the, the post office or the time they anticipated it hitting people's households? Yep, I can find out. That's important data. If they have no control, Jonathan, on when it hits your household, do they? No, they don't, but but sending things bulk. Right. You you have there's a window. It's, it's there's a three to five day window. Yeah. It's gonna be three to seven days. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so it sounds like John has taken on the um, the kind of following up on written material that might be available for town meeting and that might be um, mailable that the decision will put off until our next meeting on June 10th, right? Yeah, and that's gonna to start to create a webinar. Um, oh, I'll let him know. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. I think he actually agreed to do that. I, I, he agreed to deliver the webinar. I don't think he necessarily agreed to create the webinar, but he mm. delivered, I believe. I think his wife might have volunteered him for that and not told him about it yet. Mm, well, you know, I don't get involved in the domestic squabbles. All right, all right. Well, we'll see what we can do. Wait till after he cooks your dinner tonight. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, it should be after I do something for him, I suppose. Oh. Anyway, that's probably more information than people need in a public meeting setting. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I think that's it for old business. Then for new business, we've got to discuss a regional CDBG, that's Community Development Block Grant application yep. for a regional COVID-19 recovery micro enterprise assistance program with Greenfield as the lead community. And I think we got some information in our packet, but maybe Brian can summarize quickly for those who didn't get information in their packet. Yep. So the state received $9 million in CDBG money um, for non-entitlement communities. So that's um, anybody but the big cities, pretty much. Um, and the state's encouraging regional applications. So the, uh, the city of Greenfield is partnering with the Franklin County CDC which does a whole host of business assistance programs. Um, and they're, gonna, they're looking to apply for a $600,000 regional grant. So that'll be, um, I think it's City Greenfield and 25 other communities. Yeah, it's 26 total in Franklin County. Um, so this is micro enterprise. So that's, um, that's businesses with, I think it's, less than five employees, less than six employees, and one of those employees owns the business. Um, and because it's a CDBG grant, there's some um, income requirements as well. And I believe for the owner, um, I think it's 80% of the uh, median household income to be eligible. Um, so what would it provide? It would provide money up to $10,000 for these, these small businesses um, in the Franklin County CDC would also um, work with them on some other um, business financial assistance programs. Um, I forget the name of the, what's the pay, uh, paycheck protection program and mm -hmm. there was another one, PUA. Um, I can't remember what this, what that stands for at this point. Um, so what do we need from the town? We need just a, a written email to the city of Greenfield saying that we want to participate. Um, when the program actually gets going, the only thing that it would require us to do would be, there's some certifications that the businesses need to do. We need, we, we need to certify that they're up to date on their taxes and that they're legally operating within the town. So they're either incorporated or they're, or they have up to date. Uh, DBA certificate. 
uh, one of the downsides of the program, I think, is that the funding won't be available till August. Um, mm. So the applications due June, uh, sometime early June, but the money's not going to be available, assuming it gets awarded until August. Um, the, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any way that we could do this. We don't have the we don't have the staffing to to even come close to being able to provide this assistance. No. So I don't think there's much of a downside. I think we should do it, but is this the same tranche of money that you and I talked about in terms of the the possible um, coverage of the communications equipment? Because that was CDB, that was going to be CDBG as well. Um, no. So the money that they're talking about is is set aside for um, business assistance yeah. and social services. There was no emergency money, public safety money involved with that at all. Uh, not, I think there. I think there's two separate. I think we're talking about two separate pots of money here. Okay, and and okay. Well, I guess we can talk about that offline in terms of where the other pot of money is in terms of process. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is strictly for business assistance or social services. Okay. Well, we should do it. Do we need a vote? I think it'd be good to have a vote, yeah. All right, did I hear a motion? I make a motion to join the um, consortium that's led by uh, the town of Greenfield and the um, and and the Greenfield or the Franklin County CDC um, to implement the small business and social service assistance program. Second. Okay. All those in favor? John. Yeah. Fred. Yes. Joyce. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, so, so if there's any micro enterprise businesses in Whaley, which I think there are, yeah, um, there are, and they're listening, they should, you know, even get in touch with the the Franklin County CDC right now. Although the money won't be available, they they still have, they can still provide them different types of assistance, um, especially in these times where it's a little bit challenging to make it. So, I would definitely suggest they reach out to them and have conversations. Okay. All right, great. So our um, next item, we ready for that? Yep. Um, next item is to uh, discuss and vote to enter into a contribution and donation agreement with the Waitley Inn for Chestnut Plain Road. And my understanding is that this is primarily about the uh, Waitley Inn chipping in because that when we redo Chestnut Plain Road there, their parking lot's getting redone as well. And they need to kind of chip in for, for that. And I think there's an agreement that's been uh, worked out that Brian's gonna tell us more about it. Yep. Um, I was hoping that I would hear back from the Waitley and on, on changes to the agreement that they might want, but I haven't heard back yet. So I don't know, I don't know if, a Signing, it's the right thing to do tonight, but actually I would recommend that we probably wait. But okay. yeah, they're gonna be contributing, I think it's gonna be in the amount of $10,000. There's a small portion of that parking lot of what we would think of as the Waitley Inn parking lot. I would say 10% of it's probably on, on their property and the other 90% is in the, in the public right away there. So they're gonna, they're gonna make a contribution to cover the cost for their portion of the project. Okay. Well, so if you're moving the decision off till next time, um, that should be a quick item then on the June 10th. Will that be in time for your know, work to commence on that? Um, yeah, there was a request from the, from the end that it, it not start till after, or that they, that they would ask that we not expect a payment before June thirtieth. So, yeah. So yeah, there's time. Okay. 
All right, so unless there's any objections, we can move on to the next item. Right. Our next item is to sign the annual election warrant for June 9th to be held. Uh, it says at the Waitley Elementary School from noon to 6 p.m. That's the uh, June 9th election. Um, I don't have any problem with signing that myself. Um, John and Fred, do you have any any comments or concerns? No. No. Yeah, I think that's a pretty straightforward one. Okay. Um, does this uh, need uh, a vote, Brian? Um. Sure, why not? Okay. Everybody loves roll call votes. Sure. Oh yeah, we love. Some them. boards can do them right, and some boards can't. Yeah. If it's something we're good at, we should do it as often as possible. So I'll go ahead and do this one. Um, I move that we sign the annual election warrant for the June 9th election to be held at the elementary school from 12 noon to 6 p.m. Second. All right, thank you, Fred. Uh, all those in favor, John? Yeah. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we're really, we're dead close to the end of the meeting here. Uh, so the next item under new business is to discuss whether to extend the lease with new pro for the space at town offices. And this one, I must confess, I'm not that well uh, versed in the ins and outs of that. So I'll turn that over to Brian. So for the past, well, the end of this lease will be three years. Sorry, three years. Um, Three years that we've rented the space in the in the back of the town offices to new pro um and the intent of the lease was was for storage um i think it's evolved a little bit if that's a nice way to put it um but overall i mean it's a good source of revenue for the town the last lease we didn't increase um the rent, which is $1,800 a month, but I think we should consider that now. Um, well, I think we should consider that when we sign it. Um, I don't know that there's a pressing need for us to take that space back. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a good source of revenue for the town. One of the things I, I want to make sure of is that we're on the same page as to what can and can't be done back there, what our expectations are, because uh, originally it was storage and we had people going there, I don't know, once a day or two times a day with a forklift and getting stuff out. Now there are people parking back there. There's people, there's people there a lot. Yeah. Um, I have noticed that too. Almost every time I'm at the 10 offices, there's uh, like a car and a truck or two cars and a truck um, back there in that particular area. So it yeah. seems busier. So, I don't see any reason to get rid of them. Yeah. yeah. What's the but, time frame on, on ironing out those other details? What I want to ask them, what I want to request from them is a proposal to extend the lease. Because um, it's not it's not just straight storage. And because it's not just straight storage, then it, then then the, the rent should be increased. Okay. Um, that, okay. That, and and that's the, like your lease is good till July first or till yeah. August? It goes through June 30th. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So in a, at uh, an upcoming meeting, perhaps even as soon as the 10th, yep. we might have a proposal from them. Okay. Yep. I, right. would, I would think that if you're using the, the existing rent that you should either have an increase in that amount or establish a new rent amount and, and go from there. I, I think uh, it's time after three years that we need to increase it. Right. Okay. All right. Well, it sounds like Brian knows what the next steps are going to be then. Um, last yep. item under new business is to discuss and vote to enter into contract negotiations with the Waitley Chief of Police. So this is another contract that's ending June 30th, 2020. Yep. Um, 
Joyce and I have had some, when we we're talking about the police budget, this obviously came up um, in several of the meetings. So um, we need to make a decision as to whether we want to, or the board wants to engage in contract negotiations um, for a subsequent contract with the current police chief. I, yeah, I don't see any reason why not. It basically, to, to decide not to go into negotiations is basically like saying you buy it, right? And uh, I, I don't think that's warranted uh, at all. Um, that's just my own uh, opinion. Uh, and I think we can come to uh, an agreement on his contract in pretty short order. He's done what we've asked him to do in terms of in terms of the communication issues that that uh, we addressed what two years ago now. Um, I, yeah, I'm with Joyce. I think we should enter into negotiations. Yeah, I think some of them things we asked for before may have, I guess, kind of uh, got relaxed here while the last. Six months to a year, probably. Well, that that may be that that I, I think Fred, at some level, you're you're probably right, but I think that's as much on us as it is on anyone else. Right. Okay. Well, then I would um, I would hear a motion on, uh, or maybe I'll make the motion then to uh, vote to enter into contract negotiations with the Waitley uh, Chief of Police. Any someone care to second that? Second. Um, all those in favor? John? Yep. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Um, okay. And do you want to designate one of you to do those negotiations? Oh. Isn't Joyce the liaison? Yeah, I'm the liaison for the police, so I would volunteer for that. Um, okay. if, unless there's an objection and somebody else is really burning to do that, then they're welcome to. Uh, to, you know, arm wrestle me for it. I did it last time because this was a two-year contract. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have any burning desire to, to do it again. Yeah. So who would actually sign, would all three of us sign the contract? But Joyce would, so. and you I, yeah. negotiate the differences or whatever. Yeah. Right. I think part of the point of, of having just one of us do the negotiation is that if it's all of us, then we have to do all the negotiation in a public meeting. Right. Uh, because of public meeting laws. If one of us is negotiating on behalf of the board, that's not, that doesn't have to be done in the open. And it's negotiating someone's personal contract. So it seems like uh, something that you know, you'd like to be able to do um, at first, you know, not in a public meeting situation. And then, of course, everything gets discussed in a public meeting when it comes to all three of us signing off on the contract. So I don't get to sign off on it by myself, right? Yeah. Right. I bring it back and I give the reasons why in our negotiations <coughs> we, uh, we went the way we did. And then if you don't like the job I did negotiating it, you can, you can vote it down. So that's um, okay. procedurally, have, have I got anything wrong on that procedure, Brian? No, I think that's correct. Yeah. Time for Joyce. This contract goes till June 30th, and if we don't act within so many days, does it just continue? Um, I'm not sure what the law says about it, but his employment would continue, yes. Right. Yeah. I so there's, I don't see I don't see any problem with negotiating a contract. We, we had already kind of started talking about it back in February, and I think even we met in early March. Uh, I think we're we're on track for a contract that will be agreeable to both the town and the police chief. Okay. I I, I don't anticipate there being a problem that we can't come back here and have a uh, a contract that we'll be happy with. But, but I, I, I appreciate your question about contingency. Okay, well, I guess I don't know what discussions you've had in the last several months with him, but he's proposed changes to 
during the budget process that I, I guess we haven't really acted on, and I don't know whether that stuff still on the table for discussion or not, or how that's been resolved. I think, oh, I, I know he wanted another full-time officer and et cetera. Um, uh, informally, I think it's really, and the finance committee uh, is, is also, is, it, the police budget is of course under the finance committee's jurisdiction to some extent. Um, I think basically they, they can't do a full-time officer and keep our town budget in line. So I think that's off the table. Um, he had asked for um, a raise in salary. That's, I think, the only thing to negotiate. Okay. And that's, so I, I think that's where it stands. If that's, I don't know if I've divulged too much already. But, um, but that, I mean, the negotiations are, are, I mean, he's been very public about what he would like for, uh, for a raise. And then, well, we got to talk about it. Okay. Be strong. All right. I will try. Oh, I'll think of you, Jonathan. I'll try and be really strong. Okay. Uh, I think that's the end of the new business here. Um, then uh, town administrator updates. And we're at the two-hour mark, Brian, just to point the clock out. Oh, uh, we were. We are at the one hour and fifty-six minute mark. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, but my kids aren't in bed yet, so I got time. <laughs> wow. Just kidding. Mm -hmm. um, where's, where's Spring Road Bridge Project? Um, we're about to issue the notice to proceed to the contractor. So they'll start work in mid-June. Um, and we have this signed copy of the agreement from Mass DOT for the additional funds. So that gives us the right around the quarter of a million dollars for the project. So um, that is signed. So they can't take it back. Of course, they probably could, but um, it signed and they gave it to us. So that's good. Um, we also have the signed agreement for to extend the complete streets money that we had for the, the Chestnut Plain Road sidewalks. That money was supposed to go away at the end of June uh, 2020, but obviously for obvious reasons, we couldn't get it out to bid the past couple months. So that's been extended another 12 months. So those are lined up. Uh, to continue to move forward. Um, so CARES Act funds, those are money directly to Waitley's $139,350. And that's eligible, eligible costs. So that's response costs directly related to COVID-19. Um, portion of that can be used for FY20 reimbursements. And portion of that can be used for um, FY20 costs through this, through next December. Um, so right now we're we're collecting all of our costs. We're adding them up to what we spent so far. We can project for the for May and June um, what our expenses will be, and the they'll essentially give us the money um, without too much documentation. Um, at the end of the year. At the end of the at the end of the fiscal year, and at the end of the at the end of the um, at the end of next December, any additional money that we have, if we haven't spent it or don't have eligible costs for it, we'll have to give it back. Um, so we have our typical costs for uh, personal protective equipment. Um, there's going to be some costs related to I think the Northampton Public Health Nursing Program. You know, they're doing the contact mm -hmm. tracing through the foothills, so there's a cost there. Um, and we have um, other costs. Uh, eligible categories are pretty much um, anything to do with um, maintaining your core municipal services, anything to do with schools and remote learning, and it really costs associated with uh, expanding your public health mission. So our first application or application for reimbursements due June 5th, and that's for FY20. So we'll be submitting that. And then there'll be a second round of, there'll be a second time where we can request reimbursements in FY21. So I know there's talk about different communities 
um, purchasing laptops for the schools. I haven't seen anything official from Whateley Elementary School. I know they were they were thinking about that idea. Um, other ideas that we've had, um, possibly purchasing some laptops to to help people telework at the town offices. Some people are using personal computers, and some people are using um, we'll call them outdated computers. Um, but I don't see how we get to 139,000, but then hopefully we don't get there because that means we've had significant costs. Um, there's been talk about whether the electronic messaging boards would be an eligible cost. So those are the ones that you can program, you kind of you see them on the highway sometimes um, for communication purposes. I'm not, we'll have to explore that a little bit more and maybe submit a request to the state to see if that's eligible or not. Um, and whether any part of the, the build out of the town offices in the back um, would be, could be eligible because we, we, need, we need to separate offices to the extent that we can. Um, those are just that's some of the ideas question. that we've had. Yep. You said the total amount was 39,000 or 139,000? 139,000. Well, it sounds like there could be a good, I mean, I, I, I don't know that much about the school's needs. I know a lot of the other towns are, are putting a lot of that into their technology at their elementary schools. Because I know as a teacher myself, the kind of the technology on the home end for even many of my college students was really not conducive to good learning. And yeah. um, and I, so I would, I guess, in, encourage um, us to be in touch with the school about that and see what do they think are good additions to their technology that might help um, for the coming year, because I don't think they even think they're gonna be in person in the fall. I, I can't imagine third graders following social distancing, <laughs> you know, um, having had uh, two third graders uh, in my life within, uh, well, within my memory at least. So I, I, it's, it's a substantial amount of money that to try and to not, I don't want to send any of that back, right? Right. If that's kind of our allotment, then let's see what we can do to uh, improve technology at the schools. I heard other school districts are like buying a lot of Chromebooks for students to take home. I am not trying to advertise Chromebooks. I, I think in many ways they're, they're not that great, uh, but the school would be the, those would be the people who could decide what is the appropriate technology. So maybe it's a good idea to, to be in touch with them and see if we can work together on spending as many of those pennies as we can. Yeah, I think I sent out, I think I sent it out to uh, to Darius and Christy. Oh, okay. So I bet they're thinking about it then because that's beyond yeah, their personal, job and they do a good job, right? Beyond personal, you know, Chromebooks or, 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 or surfaces or whatever you buy, there's also a lot of software technology for, for, for camera enhancements and, and, and other mm. instructional delivery oh, yeah. that I am certain we don't have. And it enhances distance learning dramatically. Um, so I, I think that's that's a good good feature. Brian, I'm also wondering, I'm gonna go I'm gonna kick the kick the horse again, this communication stuff, why doesn't that fit? Um, I don't can we we need to be able to argue that it that it's a direct response to COVID nineteen. The direct cost incurred in our response to COVID nineteen. Yeah, and we need that. that if we, I, I think that in the times, of, in the economic challenge times that we have under COVID, um, it makes funding this equipment a challenge. Um, and if we cannot fund it we are on a communication island not having public safety communication vehicles, methods. How does that sound? We can well, explore that. I'm, <laughs> I'm more than happy to explore it. 
I think we should explore it. I, I genuinely think we should explore it. I, I think that, again, yeah. our revenues are down. Our revenues are going to be down next year in all likelihood. We, the communication systems that we have currently for public safety and emergency response are outdated and will be non-existent within X number of months. We cannot afford to do this right now. And if the, and, and, and so, so these funds could, are, are a direct result of the new economic realities of COVID. I'm happy to spin that more. Yeah, we can, we can definitely explore it. I forgot the, the other things, um, senior meals. Deerfield's um, gonna take care of it. We'll have costs for a senior meal. For all three towns. You're gonna pay for everything? For all three towns, because it's a, it's a cost lighting? incurred. <laughs> Fair point. Um, I have not gotten that, well, I've, had e I, I've seen emails back. I will, okay. we are meeting on Friday afternoon and I will make sure that it's going to happen. And then the other thing we need to know is um, South County EMS. What about if there's, any, if there's any costs associated with their response and how they're going to divide that up. Okay. It, I mean, it's an opportunity, you know, if there were costs incurred and each town has, you know, these sums of money, presumably if they can shift the cost there and get reimbursed and it, then it pads their E and D for the next year. Right. Right. Well, my, my guess right, is, is it would be the same system as the, as the senior center would be with, with Deerfield being the, the, the town of, um, you know, the town agent, fiscal agent. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that that's happening. Yep. But it just areas for cost savings. And in that case, if they can ship, if they can get reimbursement, it, it will, it should increase their retained earnings. So. Right. Which you can use to reduce right. our budget next year. Right. Um, and of course we don't, so we have the application June 5th for FY20. So that that's going to take us May through June. Um, we obviously don't want to spend everything up front and have nothing for 21 if, you know, if things start going south and we need more costs, you know, there's more, we need more PPE and we need more. So we'll put a, in a reasonable application that I'll share with you guys before it goes in. Um, I'm trying to remember what their name is. DMCTC, Debilitating Medical Treatment, Debilitating Medical Condition Treatment Centers, the, the folks who requested the remote community outreach meeting. Um, I have not heard back as to when their date will be. So I think they're looking for a moderator. Our moderator declined to, to uh, participate. So they're trying to set a date for that. Um, I believe the library egg hunt is going to happen or is happening. Um, that was the idea from the friends of the, uh, I keep calling them friends of town hall, friends of the library, that there would be um, these eggs placed through, you know, throughout the, I don't know if we can still call it the town common, but Chestnut Plain Road area for people to find. And I believe that you can get more information on the library social media that social media site about that. It's a driving and walking activity that people could do outdoors uh, with strict social distancing required by household unit. Um, again, that was delayed a little, we asked them to delay that because we thought it should, they should probably wait a little while till things calm down a little bit and it started opening back up. Um, I did receive the, the list of proposed projects from the CPC. So there's a copy of those in your packet.
So the projects, so these will be included on the annual town meeting warrant. Um, the projects that they're looking to fund uh, is uh, $13,200 to continue the gravestone restoration in the town cemeteries, $60,000 towards the purchase of a conservation restriction and recreation of trails at Waitley Center Woods. So that's the Doshi property. Um, $10,000 towards the cost of planning assistance for updating the town's open space plan. $11,000 for the local share of an APR on 33 acres of farmland on Long Plain Road. And $10,750 for another APR on 20 acres of farmland at 239 River Road. So those are the ones that will be on the warrant um, at the annual town meeting. I also included um, some bylaw amendments that have been submitted for the annual town meeting warrant. There's a proposed scenic roads bylaw. I think we have reviewed this, which seems like forever ago, um, three or four months ago. Um, this is um, gives the it relieves the planning board and uh, the tree warden from having to hold public hearings for what's really routine maintenance um, on scenic roads. Um, so if you have any questions about that, we can talk about that. And then the other ones are the solar bylaw revisions that the planning board has been working on and the change to the aquifer protection overlay district, which is required by mass DOT in terms of um, animal manure in um, zone one and zone two districts. Again, that's being required by mass, D uh, mass DEP in order to approve the, the water merger, the combination of the two systems. Is that the last thing I had? Um, you have an annual report written here. Did yeah. that get covered? Yeah, I think oh I think the annual report is is ready to go. I think Amy's sending it to the printer or sends it to the printer. Um and I think it will also be available electronically. Um so there's one of uh, one other thing that came up today, and I think we could do this electronically, sign and scan. Um we need to sign a bid form from, um, for the highway bidding that's done by FERCOG. So Keith does his highway bids, regional highway bids. Um, so I'll send that along. We just need to authorize FERCOG to uh, make the awards. Um, I got an email from Adelia asking about when, this, again, this seems like forever ago, when the town hall shed. Storage shed, I had totally forgotten about this, when they can move forward with that. Uh, looking back, I think they have all the approvals they need. They have the approval from the building inspector. They have the approval from Mass Historic Commission. And I think this board was okay with uh, them doing that. I thought they approved it, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, there was, Keith forwarded me an email from the Whaley Inn and I think they have tentative plans to, um, I think they'd like to put up a tent in part of their parking lot and it would probably be on a little bit of the town layout um, to, try to, to try to provide some outdoor dining options when they are able to reopen. Um, it's likely that when they reopen, I, I would imagine they're gonna, be, they're gonna have capacity limits and they're gonna have to take tables out and sit, seat people certain distances apart. Um, so they were wondering if that would be um, a possibility. And if you guys had any objections to that. I, I have no objections at all. They're, they're, they're good partners, they're good neighbors. We should maximize economic opportunity for people who have been crushed over the past few months when, uh, when out, when health restrictions are lifted or modified. Yeah, I assume they'll, they'll do the right thing for safety if they need to cone off one of their 
entrances off of, say, off of Chestnut Plain Road and just have people park in the back or what, I'm sure they're going to take care of the um, health and safety things. I don't know if um, that's a process where they have to run things by uh, presumably Board of Health. Um, I don't know if uh, Chief of Police has to look at any changes to traffic patterns, but I, you know, my, my guess is they'll propose something reasonable. People will make other good suggestions and we should get out of the way. Yeah, I know they'll need a fire inspection. Um, mm. I, I think Keith has asked them to put, obviously we'll, uh, I mean, I'm comfortable leaving it up to their discretion, but they'll, they'll need to put up Jersey barriers to separate the, you know, the parking oh. lot, tent area, so. Um, okay. But I just wanted to run that, run that idea by you guys. So, would, so who would have to approve they're doing this? Do, or does anybody need to approve them doing this? Board of Health or us or what? Um, I mean, if it's gonna be a portion of the, I mean, it's on town property, right? A portion of it will likely be on town property. Right. So it would require to go to this point. Yeah, just because okay. their parking lot is, right? <laughs> yeah. We've got other, other establishments that could be in the same situation, not on town property necessarily, but have uh, indoor seating that may, may not be able to be used, so. Yep. In most cases, tent, you, you set up a tent. If the tent's big enough, you need to build, you know, you need to approve of the building inspector and usually a fire inspection. Okay. Uh, you go back for a minute. One of your comments you made and you send us the, the bylaw for the, the uh, solar farms provisions. Uh, and I know planning board is, is, Matt, you was so yesterday, I think, to finalize it. And then two weeks ago, they they had the public hearing. Uh, both of these, the same time we had budget hearings. And mm -hmm. I know each each department kind of has their own schedule of, of doing stuff. And I guess maybe looking in a, into the future, it would be nice if... <laughs> we would have separated these or not on the same day as, as other town business to at least get the finance and select board opportunity to, to attend uh, just to see their presentation and what people in town comments they have uh, before it's presented in a final, final product at, at the uh, annual town meeting. You know, we, we had some issues with, with zoning with zoning bylaws at the last annual town meeting. There was a lot of discussion and, and amendments right at the very end, and people were hesitant because they didn't see it in writing and didn't have opportunity beforehand. Uh, I, I, I don't know how this can be, you know, in the future, made better than it is now. Uh, uh, and, and I don't know... You know, if you know Brian, did, did, was there much discussion? Did many people attend these the, the two meetings they've had on this? I'm trying to find out. I'm trying to find out when the public hearing was. I think it was it was two weeks ago when we had our, our first meeting with finance. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. I I can tell you, Fred, that the most of the people who attended were people who wanted to put big restrictions on solar. Right. And I personally, I haven't, I have to, I was told by the planning board to please put it in writing and get it to them. So, and I have not done that yet, but I will do that. Um, that, you know, that I, I personally, I have objections to it, but I think right now here at our meeting, that's not uh, an item on our agenda per se to have a discussion of the pros and cons of that. Um, they have emailed all of us their proposed bylaws. I think Brian had sent something out about, um, uh, you know, portions that he had concerns about, I think you should look at those. Um, and I can, I, I agree with Brian about his concerns and I actually have some other concerns too. Um, and uh, basically as far as amendments go on town meeting floor, um, you can propose something that's uh, less restrictive but not more restrictive. 
And that may be what happened. It may be that that's going to happen again on this, but I completely agree with you that the timing of their hearings was really poor, right? right? Because we, they were always in the same weeks that we had like finance and select board right. back to back. And um, if in the future we could uh, suggest that uh, those schedules be kind of, um, you know, done a little bit better, I think that's a really good idea, Fred. Okay, so where do we stand on what they propose now? Is this? I think we all have to read what they've got and and think about it. And yeah, you know, Brian is. Our, yeah, I think there's an email from Brian from way. Oh, it's like way back in March, when when all of this was first coming out, or February even. Um, so I, I'm sure you have copies of that in your email. Yeah, the hearing. The actual hearing was held on. March 10th. March. I think that was a day when we were still meeting in person because I remember going to the finance committee and then going over to the town hall yeah, where their yeah. hearing was and then coming back to the finance committee meeting. Um, I went over there for it and yep. it really, it was, it was, um, I, I'm very disappointed in that hearing myself, but. Yeah. That was when I was away. So I'm, I'm, right. I need to play catch up. Yeah, there was a lot of misinformation going on at the meeting. That's uh, that's kind of my final thought on it. And um, that's, it, I mean, it's kind of too bad it came down that way. And then we've all been so slammed right. since then. But um, uh, I uh, maybe through Brian, I can share what I plan to send to the planning board um, as far as it'd be my own um, opinion. Um, I plan to let them know. So... Um, maybe that would be uh, an item we can discuss on the next uh, agenda. Uh, because I think at some point we have to decide whether we're going to say select board recommends or not. Uh -huh. on all these. And I, what I'm sort of hearing from you is you don't feel like you're well informed enough about the public discussion of that bylaw to be able to make an informed decision. And I think that that's a valid point. I, and, and maybe this is a, my concern is for the future that whenever we have these kind of changes come up in bylaws that to make sure town, town departments and offices have an opportunity to, even if they don't comment, but just to, to be there and, and hear and observe what's going on. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying obje I object to what they did, but I guess I would like to hear what kind of discussion went on to know whether they really address the public comments or is it just this group of four people that decided? Hmm. So, okay. Yeah, we can, I can communicate with them to yeah. try to try to not have us on the same night. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the things that I know, Brian, you, you try to avoid as much as possible and you do you do it when we can, but there's times yeah. it doesn't. And this one of them that I guess we need to pay more attention to in the future. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, do we have any items not anticipated? If no, I would um, entertain a motion to adjourn. Absolutely, a motion. I'll second that. All those in favor? John? Yeah. Fred? Yes. Me? Yes. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I guess next time we meet, we're going to rearrange the board uh, since there'll be an election between now and our next meeting, unless we have a, an emergency meeting beforehand. Um, okay, so, good night, everybody. Good night, everybody, and uh, the FCAT hosts, if you can stop the recording while you're uh, finishing up there, that would be great. Night, everybody.